Okay, so in this lecture, we look at something called the Liouville's theorem and another theorem which is an immediate consequence of the Liouville's theorem, namely the fundamental theorem of algebra. Okay, so, so the Liouville's theorem tells us that if a function is entire, right, so it's analytic everywhere in the complex plane and it's bounded, right, so bounded means that the magnitude of this function is never greater than a certain constant, then f of z is constant throughout the plane, right, so that's the content of the Liouville's theorem, right, so there is, this is a very powerful result and so what it means is that basically there are no non-trivial functions that are analytic everywhere and are also bounded, right, so which also means that, you know, we are familiar with lots of functions which are entire, we have looked at exponential of z, exponential of minus z, sine z, cos z, you know, any of these trigonometric functions or you know, other kinds of functions which are functions of e to the z, right, some hyperbolic cosine function, hyperbolic sine function, many of these functions we have, you know, we are familiar with and we know them to be entire functions, but basically what Liouville's theorem tells us is that it cannot be bounded, right? So if it is bounded and also entire, then there is no way that this function can be anything other than a constant. It is a very dull, boring sort of function, which is just f of z is equal to a constant, right? So clearly sine of z is not a constant everywhere, but we know that it's entire, so it cannot be bounded, right? So that's the content of this theorem. So let's look at how to argue for this. This actually comes about, you know, which with from the Cauchy's integral formula itself, right? So we have, uh, we'll make use of the Cauchy's integral formula to, you know, to show how Liouville's theorem comes about, right? So first we observe that f of z is, is bounded in the complex plane. So that means there is a, you know, some positive constant m such that mod of f of z is less than or equal to m for all z, right? So mod of f of z can never exceed this non-negative constant m, right? So now let us write down Cauchy's integral formula for the first first derivative. So, so consider some, some point z0 which is a point of analyticity and consider a contour cr, we take it to be a circle of radius r centered about z0. Right, so since the function f of z is entire, we can be certain that you know, the conditions necessary for Cauchy's integral formula are indeed met. So the function is analytic specifically in this entire region bounded by the contour, including on the contour. And therefore, we can write down f prime of z0 is equal to 1 over 2 pi i contour integral cr f of z divided by z minus z0 the whole square dz. Right, so so now comes this argument about, you know, which is somewhat like this triangle inequality, but, you know, applied to an integral, right? So if we take a bunch of complex numbers and add them and take the modulus of the sum, we have seen that this sum can never exceed the sum of the moduli of all of these complex numbers, right? So, you know, there is a result, you know, analogous to this also for integrals. So basically the idea is if you take this kind of an integral here, well, I mean, we let's speci uh, you know specifically choose the contour. We have already chosen the contour to consist of a circle, which which can be written as z is equal to z naught plus r times z to the i theta. So it's a circle of radius r centered about z naught, and so dz therefore immediately is seen to be i times r times e to the i theta d theta. Thus, in place of f of z dz divided by z minus z naught squared, we can actually write f of z i times r times e to the i theta d theta divided by r e to the i theta the whole square. I mean, in place of f of z, I could have also written f of z naught plus r times e to the i theta, but for the, you'll see in a moment why I'm just leaving it as f of z, right? So the idea is when I put this into this contour integral, so I have, and then I'm interested in taking the mod of this, mod of f prime of z naught, well, I mean, mod of, uh, one, on 1 over 2 pi i is just 1 over 2 pi, so the i goes away and then I have this 1 over 2 pi times mod of this contour integral f of z divided by z minus z naught whole square dz, but we have just seen how this can be, you know, this integrand and dz can be replaced by this whole stuff, so I write it as 1 over 2 pi mod of 
just a regular integral now, right? So it's zero to two pi f of z i times r times e to the i theta d theta divided by r times e to the i theta the whole square, right? So in place of z minus z naught, I'm writing it as e to the r times e to the i theta. Now we make use of the fact that mod of f of z can never exceed m, so it's always less than or equal to m. So I can actually take this modulus which is applied to the whole integral after the integral has been evaluated, but then I can argue that this mod will necessarily be less than or equal to 1 over 2 pi times you know this modulus being taken inside the integral for the integrand. Right? So d theta of course is, is real, so I'm taking it over all this stuff which is which is complex and then I just allow and then I go around this contour which is a circle so then immediately I see that this f of z mod of f of z uh, you know mod of all, all this stuff is actually you know product of the mods so I can separate this out as mod of f of z times r divided by r squared but mod of f of z is necessarily less than or equal to m right? so I use that fact and I write this as Less than or equal to 1 over 2 pi integral 0 to 2 pi mr divided by r squared d theta and then d theta you know going around the circle once will just give me another 2 pi that's cancelled and i'm just left with m over r so what i've managed to show is mod of f prime of z naught is less than or equal to some constant divided by r right so this constant m is you know this is sort of part of the hypothesis we have said that this function is bounded now this fun, this m is a fixed constant but radius r can be made as large as we please so this immediately implies so i can take this r to be you know very large and so in fact this implies that mod of f prime of z naught actually has to be zero since r can you know you can take make r to be infinity basically right so m is a constant whereas r can be as large as you want so you can keep on increasing r and the only way this can hold is if actually f prime of z naught must be zero that's the only way this can hold for any r but z naught is arbitrary so in fact this result must hold for any point in the complex plane so we have the result f prime of z is equal to zero so for all values of z so in other words we managed to show that f of z is, is, is equal to a constant. So there is the only way that a function is analytic everywhere in the complex plane and it is bounded. If it is bounded and uh, entire, then that function can only be the constant function. So how do we reconcile with the fact that, you know, some functions like sine of z, um, you know, seem to have uh, not take very large values. You know all of these entire functions that we are familiar with you know have they, they acquire very large values at infinity so they have this uh, they have a singularity sitting at infinity so some function like f of z is equal to z for example has a singularity sitting at z equal to infinity it looks very nice and uh, you know it is an entire function but it's not bounded it is mod of f of z you know cannot be less than or equal to m right there's no constant m like that you'll keep no matter what uh, value you choose you'll be able to find a z such that mod of f of z will, will be greater than such a value so all of these entire functions that we are familiar with any interesting entire function is not going to be uh, bounded right so that's a very important result that's known as the Liouville's theorem and from Liouville's theorem follows an extremely important result which is called the fundamental theorem of algebra so it says that any polynomial p of z which is a, can be written as a naught plus a1 z plus a2 z squared so on all the way up to a n z to the n a n not equal to zero because it's an nth degree polynomial has at least one zero right so that is you'll be able to find the point z naught a complex number z naught such that p of z naught is equal to zero so this is known as the fundamental theorem of algebra and so in fact we have made use of this in when we looked at some properties of linear vector spaces and you know, finding the eigenvalues of a matrix and so on so there are very important consequences of this theorem right so and so effectively what it means is that 
any polynomial can be can be factorized into you know exactly n factors some of those may be repeated so we know that you can write take a polynomial and write it as z minus z1 times z minus z2 times z minus z3 all the way up to z minus zn right some of these may be repeated so you will actually get you know z minus z1 the whole power 2 for example then but the sum of these you know powers of these factors will all add up to exactly n so there are going to be exactly n roots right which is a consequence of this because the way you argue is if it is true that a polynomial of degree n has has at least one zero then you take this find this zero and divide this polynomial by z minus z naught then you'll get a polynomial of degree n minus one and if polynomial of degree n minus one also must have at least one zero right and then you keep on reducing it until you reach you know just a constant right so basically you know at every level you can argue that there's a factor so there's a zero and therefore in fact it is always possible to take any polynomial and factorize it into its factors which is connected to the zeros right so very important theorem has lots of important consequences but let's see how it can be beautifully argued directly from the Jobel's theorem right so the way to do this is to consider this function f of z equal to 1 over p, p of z so provided I mean suppose we uh, make the hypothesis that p of z has no zeros right so in fact it's like a contradiction of this uh, theorem suppose it is true that f of p of z has no zeros and then we will argue that this function f of z is equal to 1 over p of z must be bounded right so the way to do that is to write p of z as z to the n times a n plus w so you pull out this factor z to the n and so you have you know right the w is basically a naught divided by z to the n plus a1 divided by z to the n minus 1 so on all the way up to a n minus 1 divided by z and then also you have a n right i have separated out a n and then i have written it as this whole stuff is just w so then we argue i mean it's uh, the generalized triangle inequality so mod of w is mod of this sum is less than or equal to sum of the moduli right so now we can always find a sufficiently large r such that whenever mod z is greater than r you know after all you have uh, you know z z to the n z to the n minus 1 all of these guys sitting in the denominator right so you can always find a sufficiently large r such that each of these quantities is sufficiently small basically so right? it's always possible you can choose an r such that this guy this quantity becomes small this quantity becomes small because after all you have the power to make z as large as you want so if you, you can always find an r such that each of these quantities is less than mod a n by 2 n so now you'll see in a moment why we want to make it less than after all this is, this is a constant so given any constant you'll be able to find an r such that all, each of these is smaller than that constant so it turns out for our purposes it's enough to choose this constant to be mod a n divided by 2 n so that what it means is mod w is less than or equal to you know n times mod a n divided by 2 n which is nothing but mod a n by 2 right so if so we managed to show that there is always an r such that mod z when mod z is greater than r mod w will be less than or equal to half mod a n and then we can argue that this mod of a n plus w that appears here right so this guy is greater than or equal to mod of you know mod of a n minus mod of w so this is basically the triangular inequality applied in the other direction right so we want to get a greater than or equal to symbol here so we have to do mod of a n minus mod w but mod of minus w is greater than or equal to half mod a n so if using this result we just obtained so we managed to show that mod of a n plus w is greater than or equal to half mod a n and so this is this is what we want to show whenever mod z is greater than r so if we combine this so immediately we have this result that uh, mod of f of z which is nothing but mod of 1 over p of z which is nothing but 1 over mod of z to the n times 1 over mod of w plus a n this is going to be less than or equal to 1 over r to the n times 2 divided by mod a n so basically what we have managed to show is that you know in the region with mod z greater than r this function mod of this function f of z is bounded 
right so it's bounded it can never exceed a certain value right you can always find an r such that this condition holds right so basically mod f of z is is bounded and so since f of z has uh, so we have assumed that p of z has no zeros so if p of z has no zeros so it's a it's an analytic function p of z therefore one of p of z is also very nice uh, you know continuous function there is no difficulty because there is no zero and so this function is both entire and it's also bounded right so we can also argue that in the interior of this circle of radius r i'm not going to go into the details of this argument basically the point is that inside a finite closed bounded region if your function is continuous since there is no there is no zero for the denominator this function f of z is is continuous everywhere inside inside this region and any function which is con continuous in a closed bounded region will have a maximum it can it cannot blow up at any point right so this is you know one can argue based on just the definition of continuity here so, right? so therefore it is bounded outside of this region and bounded inside this region therefore we have managed to show that this function f of z is is analytic everywhere and it's also bounded and provided f of z well, p of z has no zeros right but then the, the only way this function f of z can be bounded and also entire is if f of z is, is a constant and but f of z is not just a constant because p of z is, is a is a genuine polynomial of degree and so there's a contradiction therefore the only way this can happen is if p of z has at least one zero right so this proves the desire okay so we have gone over this argument you know somewhat in a fairly detailed way but basically the point is that it's a direct consequence of Liouville's theorem which says that a function which is entire and bounded is a trivial constant and we have argued that if a polynomial p of z does not have any zeros then this will uh, force a function like f of z is equal to 1 over p of z to become just a constant which is a contradiction and therefore any polynomial of degree n must have at least one zero which I, we have also said immediately implies that a polynomial of degree n will have n factors although some of these may be repeated okay so that uh, so we have seen such a beautiful and powerful result which has applications in all fields of mathematics come out of some simple arguments involving the cauchy's integral formula which comes about in in, in the field of complex analysis but this result itself has you know, wide applications in many fields of mathematics. That's all for this lecture. Thank you.